The Dardanelles, Turkey's historic waterway, link between east and west, fought over centuries ago by ancient powers and in our own times by modern powers. Turkey, linchpin of Middle East strategy, with the Mediterranean on one side and Soviet Russia on the other. Turkey has cradled much of the history of kind. Here ruled the Hittite kings 2,000 years before Christ. Here stood Troy, the city which fell to the subterfuge of the wooden horse. These are the ruins of the Temple of Diana, one of the seven wonders of the world. Here stood the churches and palaces of the Byzantine Empire, twice sacked by the Crusaders and captured by the Ottoman Turks. The Turkey of old merged into the Turkey of today, the cosmopolitan Turkey the tourist knows. of Byzantium, the mosques, the sunlit courtyards, the bazaars, and then what is perhaps the true heart of Turkey, the wide sweep of the Anatolian plains with its flocks and herds. The cornfields, the orchards and vineyards, the peasants, the fishermen, the shepherds. This is the Turkey in which Kemal Atatürk, 30 years ago, began his social and political revolution, one of the most remarkable the world has seen. In 1950, this revolution culminated in free elections fought principally between the People's Party, led by President Ismet Inonu, and the Democratic Party, whose strength lies in the new middle class. passed peaceably to the Democratic Party led by Kalal Bayar. Under the inspiration of Kamal, Turkey had made changes in 30 years more drastic in some ways than in the previous 700 years, notwithstanding that the rise and fall of the Ottoman Empire had been almost as spectacular as that of Rome. This Ottoman Empire was born at Bursa in Asia Minor in the 13th century. It succeeded by war and conquest. At Kosovo, it defeated the Slavonic kingdoms of the Balkans. Later, it captured Constantinople and smashed the Byzantine Empire. The present supplanted the cross. Before the time of expansion was finished, the empire had laid siege to Vienna. Under Suleiman the Magnificent, last of the great sultans, this empire, which 300 years earlier had been a tribal kingdom, now stretched from Hungary in the north to the Arabian Sea in the south, from the Caspian Sea in the east to Algiers in the west. It ruled millions of people, both Christian and Muslim, and so far as territory went, was the greatest empire of its time. This mighty empire, cruelly oppressive, now began its decline and fall. In a series of wars, the Christian powers crippled Turkey on sea and land. Within her borders, oppressed Christians rose in revolt By the beginning of the 20th century, she'd lost most of her European possessions. In the war with Italy, Tripolitania was taken from her. A coalition of the four Balkan kings defeated her on the eve of the First Great War. These defeats brought about a revolution inside Turkey. The revolt of the young Turks led by Enver Pasha against Abdul Hamid II. By 1914, three centuries after Suleiman, undermined by bad government and disastrous wars, Turkey had shrunk to this. But the young Turks were no wiser than the old Turks. They led their country into the Great War on the side of Germany against the might of the Allies. The 
outstanding incidents of the campaign are still remembered. The break through the Dardanelles by German warships. The Gallipoli campaign. The revolt in the desert led by Lawrence of Arabia. Allenby's sweep through Syria and Palestine. The entry of Allied fleets into the Dardanelles and of Allied troops into Constantinople. Sultan Mohammed VI, last of the Sultans, signed an ignoble peace treaty, but not all Turkey accepted it. Kemal, then military commander at Erzurum, did not accept it. He raised a standard of revolt both against the Allies and the Sultan, and after a successful campaign known as the War of Independence, faced the Allied troops in Istanbul itself. The upshot was a new peace treaty negotiated by Inyonyu, Kemal's right-hand man, which gave the Turks better terms. It did more. It opened the road for the creation of modern Turkey. It was this ancient Turkey on which Kemal had to build, a Turkey still dwelling in the Middle Ages, in which women were veiled, the church dominant, corruption commonplace, science and mechanical industries almost unknown, and the elementary rights and interests of ordinary people mostly ignored. By contrast, Kemal's Turkey was to be, as he said, republican, nationalist, populist, state socialist, secular and reformist. He renounced all claims to territories formerly held by Turkey, but inhabited by non-Turkish people. This then was to be the new Republic of Turkey. Among the first reforms, Kemal abolished the Fez, which he looked on as a symbol of hatred of progress. He gave women civil rights, which encouraged them to unveil themselves. He abolished the Arabic script and introduced the Roman alphabet, himself acting as school teacher to his family, to officials, and later touring the country with a blackboard. He reformed the legal system and made all equal before the law. The Quranic law was replaced by the Swiss Civil Code. Courts are public and open. Women act now both as public prosecutors and defending counsel, even sometimes as judges. This has advanced on most Western countries. He reformed the army. He created a one-party state. There had been no popular demand for change. He had had to create opinion rather than reflect it. His method was that of a dictator. A dictator, he said, so that Turkey would never need another dictator. But his work was not completed when he died in 1938. Kemal was succeeded by Ismet Inyonyu, his closest associate, who continued Kemal's work. In the Second World War, Turkey until 1944 was neutral. Germany, in the person of von Papen, the German ambassador, sought Turkey's favors on the one side, obtaining from her precious chrome ore and other products. Britain, America, and Russia used their influence in the opposite direction and supplied her with war material, including anti-tank guns and hurricane fighters. In 1944, Turkey broke off all relations with Germany. Finally, she had probably one to two million soldiers under arms and a large force of military aircraft. A heavy drain on her manpower and finances, although not engaged in actual fighting. What then is the Turkey that has emerged since the war? And how deep have the reforms gone that Kemal started? The outstanding fact is that in most cases, the manners, customs, clothes, and ideas of the children are quite different from those their fathers had a generation ago. The new generation could, in some ways, be said to speak a fresh language. This is due to one main thing, the reform of education, which now includes the much wider education of women, and removing education from the control of the church. In some schools, 
uh, religious instruction has now been reintroduced. Sports have become a feature of the people's life. Wrestling and horsemanship were always famous. Today, boxing, football, swimming and basketball are becoming equally popular. Science and arts were freed by Kemal from the restriction of Muslim dogma. Since then, the living human form and animal forms have been freely portrayed and sculptured, something that had never happened in Turkey. Today, Turkey has its Academy of Music and Drama and its Grand Opera. Classical plays and music, seldom if ever performed in Turkey 20 or 30 years ago, are now well known. Alongside this, interest in Turkish national art has revived. Modern Turkey is a mixture of the old and the new. For the first time in her history, the interests of the peasant and worker are being looked after. There is a balance kept between the rich and the poor. A striking feature of the new Turkey has been the building up of industries, which, although small compared with those of Western countries, employ today five or six times as many people as in the old Turkey. The steel industry is entirely new. Coal mines have been extended and brought more up to date. And new factories have been built for wool, paper, cement, chemicals and cotton. The state owns about three-fourths of the manufacturing industries and has a monopoly for such things as cigarettes, alcohol, sugar, and artificial silk. But Turkey remains predominantly an agricultural and pastoral country. Three quarters of her 19 million people live off the land. Indeed, more land is owned by those who live on it than in any country in Europe. But the life of peasants is hard. Winters are bitter. Houses are poor. Indeed, some villages are carved out of the rocks and hillsides. A good deal of their farming is primitive. Quite often the ploughs are prehistoric and occasionally carts are seen with solid wooden wheels like those used by the Hittites. Animal husbandry tends to be neglected, too. The government is endeavouring to improve farming by sending out instructors to remote villages. itself cultivates about three quarters of a million acres where the farming is mechanized. This partly to demonstrate better methods to the farming community. And it has organized centers for the cooperative use of tractors and agricultural machinery. But mechanization spreads very slowly. Turkey still has large areas that are not adequately cultivated, partly because of the lack of irrigation. Steps are being taken to improve this, but at present about one-sixth of the land is described as unproductive. Another sixth is under forests. In the past, 
land was recklessly denuded of timber for war and other purposes, but efforts at afforestation are now being made. Timber is one of the principal exports. Two others high on the list of exports are dried fruits and tobacco. In 1949, a fifteenth of Britain's tobacco came from Turkey, double the amount of the previous year. Much of this tobacco is used in Britain for blending with other tobaccos. Over a fifth of Britain's dried fruits, sultanas, raisins, figs and so forth, come from Turkey. While the Turks are traditionally good gardeners and husbandmen, there remains a lack of modern technical skill and knowledge of the help that modern science can bring. The village institutes, a most significant development, are doing important work in this direction. The directors of these institutes often create them in a very real way, putting up the buildings, developing the water supply, overcoming disease, often turning a wilderness into a farm and orchard. The chief aim is to turn out elementary teachers. And in doing it, the studies are divided equally between book studies and practical work. The men learning to be land workers, builders, blacksmiths and so on, and the girls busy with spinning, weaving and sewing. The need for far more teachers and technicians is one of the country's major problems. The second urgent need is for better roads and communications. Republican Turkey inherited 2,000 miles of railways and has built as much again. A further 2,000 miles are projected during the next 10 years. Of her 27,000 miles of roads and highways, only about a third are in good condition. And in making more, the machinery supplied under martial aid is of the first importance. This lack of railways and roads is at the heart of Turkey's needs. For getting produce to the ports to enable her to pay her way, to help the progress made in the towns to spread to the countryside, and to improve the country's efficiency in the matter of defence. This question of defence brings us to Turkey's greatest need of all a long and enduring peace. The straits she controls, the Dardanelles and the Bosphorus, are a constant anxiety. In 1936, the Montreux Convention allowed her to re-fortify the straits and lay down regulations governing the passage of merchantmen and warships in peace and war. In 1945, Russia asked for defense in common of the straits, generally taken to mean a request for naval and air bases in that zone. The request was refused, and the treaty of non-aggression with Russia lapsed. Turkey has a frontier with Russia 350 miles long, a frontier which has very poor communications with the heart of Turkey. Although she receives martial aid and United States military aid, Turkey has to spend, like many other countries, much too great a proportion of her budget on defense, on keeping her army, her air force and her navy in a state of preparedness. Turkey stands between East and West, a link between Europe and Asia, firmly attached to the Western powers, a member of the Council of Europe, and associated with Atlantic Pact defense plans in the Mediterranean, she is a country with whose future the statesmen of the world are closely concerned. The reforms she has carried out in the past 30 years have made her able to face her destiny with greater strength and assurance in this modern age.